He's doing things to really change lives in a remarkable way using extremely cutting edge technology. So without further ado, Scott Summit. Thanks, Tina. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to be here, um, and it's great to see everybody. This is the kind of crowd that I relate to most, the, the wild-eyed blue-sky thinkers in the, in the area. Um, I, I, like Tina was saying, I used to be an industrial designer. I guess I still am. But that was doing mass-produced lots of stuff for high-tech companies in the area. Those days are kind of done because there's some new exciting technology that allows us to think in very different ways. And I just got really excited about what, what can be done with these, how to put these technologies to use to create something really meaningful. And so that's what I'll be speaking about today. I have always been interested in prosthetics and the, the uh, amputees and the challenges they face. And I suspect really strongly that this, uh, this stems from the same place that, that a lot of the people who are in this field, where they got their inspiration, which is growing up in the 70s and watching The Six Million Dollar Man every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. This was an inspiration for us. It seeded an entire generation with ideas because you know, the main takeaway from the show was that a massive DARPA grant and a triple amputee, and you could do some really cool stuff. And so now the generation, you know, here 30 years later, we're all doing stuff, and we're seeing this huge growth of what can be done with prosthetics and amputees. So when I was a kid, I used to look at amputees and... I was curious about two things, about how far they're coming along. Well, the things I discovered is that, is that it isn't $6 million man time yet. It's got a long way to go, that that was a reality that came crashing down on me as a kid. And the other thing is that $6 million is, is a really poor attempt at a seed grant. You really can't do much with $6 million anymore. <laughs> you know, that, so much for that thought that it was this vast sum of money that allowed you to do everything. But I would always look at the amputees that I would see, and I was, I'd stare and just be fascinated. There's so many questions I wanted to ask them about their life and their challenges they dealt with. And the thing that I was always reminded is that you can't stare. You're not allowed to stare because that'll make them uncomfortable. You know, somebody will always remind you, don't stare at that. And now that's the worst possible response you can have because how do you make somebody more comfortable, uncomfortable than saying, don't stare because it'll make them uncomfortable? <laughs> and that struck me as strange, too, as a little kid because I'm thinking, wait, so because of this one challenge, we have a wall of separation. We have, we have to disassociate from them. We have to disconnect from this one group of people because we can't engage them. We can't, we can't connect with them. So how strange is that? Because in a sense, it's just another challenge that needs another corrective device. And this one in particular, however, has a stigma associated with it, has, has something about it that separates us in ways that others don't. But you look at other corrective devices, there are tons of them around, you know, that nobody says the same about corrective eyewear. In fact, there's actually as many people wearing corrective eyewear without the corrective part, so purely for the fashion part, as there are people wearing it for the corrective part. And there's something weird about that, because that means we've come full circle. That because the designers are involved with glasses, it means that there are people emulating less than perfect vision so that they can get the prosthetic device that accentuates who they are, that gives them the more personality, that gives a connotation. Well, that's really strange. That's come full circle, and that's really owing itself to design. And you don't look at somebody wearing eyewear and think, you, you certainly don't pity them. You're not uncomfortable around them. You don't, they don't try to disguise it, certainly. This is something that we accept. It's something fairly normal. So why does that only apply to eyewear? Why can't that extend broadly? So... There are all kinds of things. There are all kinds of prosthetic devices of sorts that, that accentuate or augment what we already have. But it really comes down to the design that separates one from the next. For example, can you imagine if Ducati had to go at designing the walker with the tennis balls? It, it wouldn't be so bad to walk around with that anymore. It, it has a sense of changing the stigma and changing the message that's associated with it. So why the problem? Well, I think one of the problems is that we have this mentality this form follows function mentality. And it's, it's kind of a bastardization of what was once said 100 years ago by Lewis Sullivan. And it's come to mean that form follows mechanical function. And so we've now come to accept that this is a mantra handed down by Lewis Sullivan, which gives us free reign of creating something that's clunky and mechanical and utilitarian instead of something that really has form and beauty to it, sometimes when it's needed. So when you're talking about form follows function in the amputee world, 
it usually stops at about this point. Form follows mechanical function, get somebody walking. But that also overlooks the complexity of humans, that we're a little bit more nuanced than that, that the body is not simply something that keeps the head from falling on the ground. It's something that we adorn. We wrap, we cover with jewelry, we tattoo. It's so much more nuanced than simply a mechanical solution can allow. And so when you're thinking about a prosthetic in that aspect, the idea of function, what does a function offer? It's much, much broader. Well, the challenge, though, with prosthetic limbs is really has a lot to do with the mechanical nature of them. Because in this case, you're talking about something that has to be mass-produced. And a lot of the artifacts from mass production are always going to get in the way. Because these, this is what you have to associate with mass production. It's one size fits all. It's inherently impersonal. It's inherently mechanical. There's nothing individualized about it. That's just the nature of mass production. That's the way it works. So that's one of the reasons such an odd juxtaposition against the human body, which is inherently mass customized. It's unique. It's emotive. It's expressive. So what I, would, what I set out to do a number of years ago was actually to look at how one might change this, how you might evolve a prosthetic leg, if you threw out some of the, the basic tenets that, that guided its evolution to this point. And so what I came up with was, okay, well, if you're going to do that, you have to create something that is really created by the person and for the person and of them, and something that's as unique as their fingerprint. And it has to be as fluid-lined as possible. It has to be as sensual and sculptural. And it has to represent their personality as well as their physicality if you're really going to do something that is a part of that person. So then I got a little, more, a little bit more um, elaborate and said, okay, what I wanted to be able to do is drop down into Jordan or Cambodia or Laos or you name it with nothing more than a camera and a laptop and access to the Internet and scan somebody, capture their data, come up with a solution and have that solution ready to go and let it go viral so that legs can propagate all over the world, solve problems. You know, that's the kind of utopian uh, vision that you set out for one of these things for. Decided also, if it was beautifully sculpted and crafted, it would, associate some of the, it, it would change some of the stigma associated with prosthetic limbs. It would change the way the person actually perceives their own body. And hopefully it would actually change then the way society sees prosthetic limbs and amputees in general. Um, it's, it's a lot worse in the U.S. or It's a lot worse in the rest of the world. Um, there are many places where an amputee is a real social stigma. It stops somebody from getting a job, from getting married all kinds of things. So it's, it's a fairly meaningful thing to start altering, uh, altering the perception that we have. The idea is that if you can change something from utilitarian to sculptural and beautiful, maybe you change the dialogue that goes on, maybe you change the perception. It had to give somebody their symmetry back, but not in a way that's mimicking or emulating a human, because that takes us into this area we call the uncanny valley something that is uncomfortably human, but not human. So the idea is to create something that's, that's beautiful, that suggests the person, that is unique, but doesn't try to be something it's not, that's as honest as it can possibly be. So that goes down to this Pandora's box of all the different technologies that have to coalesce if you're going to actually create a solution in this area. And so dove into it headlong to solve things. The first thing that had to be done was to get the body into the computer. Because from that point, no matter what you do, it's a unique artifact that is of the person. And so I realized that the 3D scanning done with the camera, it's just not there yet. Autodesk is working on it. Give it a few years, we'll get there. But right now, this is a stopgap. So I invented a 3D scanner that is two cameras, a projector. It's called structured light type scanning. 3D printed the product itself. So that's a 3D printed 3D scanner, um, the world's first of its kind. And it can scan a person in a few seconds and get a very decent scan for $5,000 and can, run, can capture both legs. A smoothing algorithm smooths it to make it fluid, but still very honest and very faithful to the person's original morphology. And then how do you get that into something physical that you can actually use? Well, that's another challenge altogether. But a quiet revolution happened in the maker world about five years ago that 3D printing used to be a way to make a disposable product, something that was fragile, that wasn't going to last very long, that was simply a facsimile of something you'd later injection mold. Well, what changed is that 3D printing now can print a physical, solid, strong, survivable artifact. Now, that changes everything, because now you can print something that will survive, that will solve your problem in that one artifact. And we've seen what happens when 3D printing is in the hands of an artist. You can create beautiful, complex structures. 
you can create things that you can really only imagine any other way. But what also is amazing about this technology is it lends itself very well to printing one thing per person. It doesn't care if you're printing a million of it or one of it. The cost is pretty much the same, unlike injection molding and unlike all the traditional means. And complexity, which is kind of the bane of the mass production world, complexity is free. More often than not, actually, complexity is cheaper than simplicity. If you make a brick and you 3D print it, it's going to be very expensive. If you make the same volume and it's a bunch of gears and parts and this and that, it's going to be cheaper because there's just less material used. 3D printing follows a very different type of math than traditional manufacturing. So when you take something like prosthetics, which have inherently complex parts and components to them, and you apply this thinking, well, now you're allowed to create a leg that is inherently customized for one person and can have great mechanical complexity built into it, and it all comes at no extra cost. So it kind of changes the game. The leg that I have here is shown on the display there in cross-section because it shows some of the uh, internal workings that actually nobody's even ever seen because it was printed um, It was printed in its entirety. The feature set that you get from 3D printing a leg entirely is, well, you get a ball and socket foot, which is, it would be a very expensive component in any other way. In this case, your plantar flexion, your dorsiflexion, your rotation of the foot, you can make it emulate human motion very accurately just because you're 3D printing it again to the specific needs of that specific person. You can create, in this case, it is a seven bar linkage knee. This would be a $20,000 knee on the open market. It all comes for free because it's just printing it. And that, that emulates human motion very accurately there. You can create tension into it. In this case, it's a very springy, very resilient material. And by 3D printing it, you have the contour in the back and the gastrocnemius, which behaves exactly like a human in the sense that it gives spring force to correct and to redirect the force of the, the foot. And finally, your load-bearing structure. It's hollow. It's trabeculated just like a bird wing. It's very, very light. So your strength to weight ratio increases because when you're 3D printing a part, you're simply printing the molecules you need and not those that you don't. So you're allowed to get away with things you could never get away with traditional manufacture. So created a number of these. Put this one on John. And he walked around. Now, the, the other goal with this is that if he wants to hide this, he puts on pants and he pulls on socks and no one knows it's there because it's an exact mirror image of his existing morphology. So he can be as discreet as he wants, but also if he wants to show it to the world, it's not so off-putting, it's not so alien, because it completes his form. This is of him and by him and uniquely his. It has a couple other kind of interesting weird attributes that aren't obvious. One is that it's made in the US. It would not make sense to make it anywhere else because you'd only incur shipping charges. That the laser doesn't care where it gets made, so it just makes sense to make it in the US. It's also the greenest possible way to make a physical thing that it's, this was created simply by a 130-watt laser running for about 30 hours. So use your garage door opener once or twice, and you've used far more electricity. You know, it's about a dishwasher being run a couple times. That's the amount of electricity it takes to create an entire leg in this case. And at the end of the day, it is curbside recyclable. <laughs> um, and then here's the other one, is that it is dishwasher safe, <laughs> which sounds weird enough, except that it's important to be able to wash your leg as well as the rest of you and your clothing and anything else, why not? And there's nothing quite like seeing the look on your girlfriend's face when she opens the dishwasher <laughs> and sees a leg staring back at her and kind of feel like Jeff Dahmer in a strange modern way. So I made a number of these. This was another one with a monocentric knee, meant to um, have a little bit less friction, a little more survivable. And the amazing thing is this actually worked. Uh, this, this guy's shorts, he didn't have shorts. He didn't own a pair of shorts before the photo shoot, so we had to cut these off. He, never, he just didn't like wearing shorts because he didn't like the attention. He didn't like the stares that he got. So now all of a sudden he's wearing this leg. We hiked all over Tahoe with this leg. So the idea worked great. We, we printed a leg, $4,000. And it had the feature set of a leg probably in the sixty dollars to $100,000 set range. And my hope of getting this virally spread throughout the world fell apart because the rest of the world doesn't have $4,000 to spend on it. I talked to the International Red Cross and I said, yeah, 400 tops. I'm trying to get it down to the 200 range. So I was an order of magnitude off. You know. So all of a sudden, the idea that I had of creating this very disruptive change in the prosthetic leg world didn't really happen, kind of fell apart. So I thought about it, redesigned everything, and thought, OK, if I'm going to create a leg that's now for the US market, let's shift markets and gears, how do you make something that's just flat out beautiful? 
That's the thing that I want to see when I wake up in the morning. That's the sports car that I get to wear and get to show off to the world. So I set about to that. And this is what was created. This is a guy named John Siciliano hit by a drunk driver at 18. And so again, 3D scan of his leg, mirrored over. But in this case, thinking a higher dime, higher budget. So did uh, leather, chrome, polished metal. And the idea is just to make it look good. Now he gets a couple other details. He gets to switch out the leather in the front because if you're going to treat it a little bit like fashion, why not? The leather is going to wear out, swap it out from, from one time to the next. And this was looking great. His girlfriend saw him wearing this. I guess wearing is a term. There isn't even a term that's terribly good for this. Um, his girlfriend saw him with this, and she said, wow, I like that leg better than your other leg. <laughs> and here he's scratching his head, and, and he's just, he turns to me and says, nobody's ever said that. Nobody says that to an amputee. That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And it's like, yeah, okay, well, that means score. That was a victory. So the problem there is that I started realizing that the amount of time it takes to create this and the complexity, this, the pure geometric complexity to create this leg was pretty prohibitive. I narrowed my market down to probably about five. And so the business model for all the business people here, they do the math and they realize, yeah, it's, that's a bad business model. So started thinking, okay, really, how do I strip this down to the core? What's the essence of it? Giving, it? giving something that's otherwise clumsy machinery, giving it a beauty and a grace and a form and a sensuality and a uniqueness that it wouldn't inherently have. And so I was riding around on the motorcycle. This isn't mine, I wish. Um, but riding around on my motorcycle thinking, okay, well, motorcycles do this all the time. You know, why don't we just strip it down to its, its basics, its essence here? And so I tried making something that was the lowest cost way to get the job done here. And I had a test pilot, Chad, here try it out. Now, Chad's a competitive soccer player. And his challenge was that you can't play competitive soccer when your leg's been replaced by a 30 millimeter titanium pipe. Because somebody's going to kick you at full speed and bust their toes and all their, their metacarpals. So, so he was not allowed to play. And on top of that, he couldn't feel the ball because you can't anticipate the trajectory of how the ball's going to ricochet off your leg when it's a 30 millimeter titanium pipe. So, scanned his sound side limb, mirrored it over, and 3D printed this leg, and we put it on him and watched him play soccer. And what was interesting is after a few weeks, this is not entirely expected, he said all of a sudden his brain started to recognize and remap this new leg to his body again. He'd lost his leg, he, eight years before he lost his leg to cancer. All of a sudden he's playing soccer competitively again because his brain is thinking that his body is in some form back. So it's it's a type of um, um, it's it's a type of, it's a way of really regaining your sense of self, your sense of physicality. We tested it for durability; it survived. I put it in my check bags a few times and traveled around the country, and yeah, it, it works. It survived. So that was this pattern. It was a very utilitarian pattern. It was meant to just be sports, structural, meant to survive. So I tried some variations on that and said, okay, well, how about looking into some old Arabic patterns from old architecture books. Or there's this woman I, I did another leg for, and she was just positive and happy and cheerful, so I wanted to kind of represent that in hers. Um, or lace, you know, what could be done here? So I started doing variations on this. This is a guy I'm working on right now in Germany. Um, business guy, he wears tweed, a herringbone. And so he's going to have a chrome herringbone back leg and a, a debossed front. Another guy, a motorcycle guy, um, it's, it's all motorcycles in this industry, um, sadly, which is good that I've got my legs scanned in advance. Um, he, he had these, tri that, that was crass, I guess. Um, he had tribal tats head to toe. Just, he was a case study in tribal tattoos. So captured one of them, recreated it in Illustrator, and laser tattooed it onto the leather. And so we're making this this week. This will go out pretty, pretty soon. So part of it is that we can do it and we're showing off. And it's, there's some artistry that we like to build into this. But part of it is, if that's the way we can connect somebody to their body, then that has meaning and that has value. We want this not to be a utility, not to be an artifact that they have to wear if they're going to walk, but something that they connect to, they relate to, that represents something expressive of themselves. Mike here, we took his old bomber jacket that he had for 10 years and took an X-Acto knife and sliced it up and laminated that to his his tibial part there. And so he now has something that was very familiar and comfortable to him as a part of his body, in a sense, and recreated the tattoo that he had on his calf. 
And so, again, just to recreate that, that body part for him. And you can't see it, but down at the very bottom, there's a little recycling symbol because <laughs> his wife thought that was really cool. And hey, it is curbside recyclable. And I just, there's something cool about that. But to be able to give somebody their shape back, your first reaction when you see them is, OK, it's different, but it's not bad. It's not freakish. It's not off-putting. And that's the goal. And all of a sudden, now Mike is showing it off to everyone he sees. He's wearing shorts everywhere he goes. Now, James came in, another motorcycle. Um, he had this tattoo on his forearm. And I was asking if, the t if he had other tats. And he said, yeah, he had one on his left ankle. And it's the same chain that you see. So recreated that, debossed that into his, his left shin. And his bike was a black and chrome Harley. And so he used black and chrome materials. And the cool thing was what resulted is that it became this kind of liaison between him and his bike. It kind of suggested some of both, that it was this, this go-between that connected to both James and his Harley. And so all of a sudden, he loved it. And the interesting thing is, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell where James stops and where the, the Harley starts. And kind of unexpected. We created another leg for Chad for him just walking around town. And I wanted to use this suede because it just looked good against his skin. But the fear of that is that that starts getting into one of the rules that I have which is that we don't want to look like a human. We don't want to look like we're pretending to be something we're not. So we put the medallion to Boston to his back. That's our logo, and he was OK with that. But the, um, we have three rules that we live by, is that we're not trying to look human. We can never emulate human, because that's, that's wrong. It's not allowed. We can never violate the person's physicality. When we do a 3D scan of them, we use that literal scan. We don't grow anything. We don't alter it. We don't make them more slender. We don't change them in any way. That's, Photoshop magazine covers, and that's just wrong. We don't have the right to do that. Um, and the third is that we don't, we don't do any gimmicks. We've been asked to do bottle openers, LED lighting, um, pistol holsters, knife holsters, you know, all kinds of things. And we just, that's, that's not really what a leg is about. This is about the body. This is not about adding gimmickry to it. So we try to talk to people and engage them what, what they like, what they connect to so that we can better represent them in the design and the artistry of the leg that we create for them. And this is what one woman sent to us. Deborah sent this. And she said that for some reason, she doesn't know why, she just relates to it. There's something sexy. There's something sensual. But at the same time, it's still cyborg. And could we capture that? And so we worked with an artist who came up with a pattern. And this being kind of a lace pattern that would still work in a very digital environment like we have. And here was the result. This is the leg that I have here. We made, a, we made copies, and she was OK with that. That we wanted to capture feminine, but we also wanted to make sure that we weren't pretending that she wasn't part cyborg in her, in her perception. That it was still mechanical. It was still man-made. It was beautiful. It was fluid, sensual, but not her original equipment. And so this was the first text that she sent that was really cool for us to get. And what? struck me about this was that people started engaging her. And instead of looking at her and looking away uncomfortably, they would look at her and stare and be OK to stare, because they knew that she was fine with it. And so all of a sudden, people are coming up to her for the first time in her life, and, or in uh, the eight years since she lost it. They're coming up to her and, and asking about it and talking to her, and OK and comfortable with asking. They're staring, but it's just for the right reasons. So then just for fun, we decided that we'd match her Chanel handbag. <laughs> This is just kind of going for style points at this point, because we can. Why not? And Chanel hasn't yet complained. And here's another text she sent a while back, that people are OK talking to her. You know, they're not looking away uncomfortably. And that changes everything. The skirt that she wore for the shoot, we had to buy the skirt for her, because she didn't even own a skirt. So then we tried another experiment here. We worked with an artist. and took her artwork and laser etched it into the leather so that she can have a tattoo on demand. You know, how cool would that be to have a tattoo for an hour and then take it off and you don't feel like that tattoo anymore? <laughs> well, she could do that. She's got all kinds of different parts, and we let her swap out her hardware whenever she feels like. And then we pushed that one a little further, took this guy uh, some tribal tats. And interesting thing is to recreate that, but to take the person away and just leave the tattoos. So we have three-dimensional physical tattoos in the shape of his original body, where some tattoos had originally been. As far as I know, that's the first time that a tattoo has 
created the body instead of just simply adorned it. We did another variation here for a mountain biker. Just wanted to capture a pattern that just represented him speed and agility. And a bike messenger. Give him a little bling, something that looks cool in the sun when he's riding through the cars. And so in this case, our whole goal is to really embody that person, to capture them, and to change their perception of how they feel about, the, about being an amputee, about their condition, about the way they treat every day. And if we can get them psyched just to wake up and wear shorts and walk around and put that on and change the way people perceive them, then that's really the victory that we've set out to achieve. That means we nailed it. The coolest thing was when this guy reaches down. He reached down after he put on his leg and he just started feeling shape and running his hands up and down it. And then after a long pause, he said, that's the first time I've felt my leg in eight years. And that was pretty cool. That means we nailed it. So that, that's our, really our goal. Thanks a lot. So the question is, I, I believe, uh, can we do anything for a double amputee? Um, yes, and we're working with a number of double amputees now. Um, it's a strange one because you actually have to, by kind of the rules that we set out, we have to transfer somebody's body to somebody else. So we've had a number of people approach us willingly being scanned as surrogates, as stand-ins for somebody else. Uh, we actually had our lawyers draft up a body morphology release document, which they were all confused to write, but they actually wrote it. Now we have people sign it because you can't have somebody come back to you 10 years later and say, hey, that's my leg. So we have the body morphology release document, and we, we are doing scans. We're working with a woman named Amy Mullins in New York. She's a double amputee. Um, she's especially difficult because she wants like three extra inches on her legs. So she's super tall, so we're looking for a really tall person <laughs> for her legs. And... Um, We've had, yeah, we've had, uh, I think, six or eight. Uh, we're working with a lot of veterans now, and when they step on a landmine, it usually takes out both. And so we've got uh, a whole string of devils that we're working with. It's, it's really challenging, but, yeah. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, if a person has a lower limb amputation, like under the knee, can you use a similar technology? And two, how exactly are you able to control all the motion of the foot? Like, if you have a double amputee, you don't have another foot that can direct the force. How does that work um, with how a person can walk without being noticed that they're walking um, with a prosthetic? Yeah, the question is, is how do we work with the below-the-knee amputees? And how do, the, um, how do the feet work? Because it is a purely passive foot. It's not a sprung foot. It's not an active foot. Um, as far as uh, below the knees, BKs or transtibials, we work probably about half and half with BKs and AKs. Um, so that's, we've kind of figured that out. It's, it's a tricky one, mainly in the kneecap, because the kneecap always splits the difference. And we can't. We have to either mount to the lower leg or the upper leg, and really hard to do a kneecap. But um, as far as the foot goes, the foot's tricky no matter what until you get into active electronics and motors. And so the eye walk out of Boston is the best thing there is to replicating real human motion. So short of that, you try to store kinetic energy and release it in the swing phase. And we can do that uh, with, with, the, with this leg in that there's a pivot. And you press here. It distorts the spring. And the spring simply stores the energy and releases it as you've gone through your stride. With the legs that you see here, um, in this case, we're not reinventing that. We're using existing components. So in this case, it's simply a shroud that attaches around the existing hardware. So we're not trying to reinvent that one right now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the team that's working on this? So I imagine that you're only one part of the team. And so, like, did you engage any medical doctors to help you with this? Or who's involved? So the question is the, the composition of the team. Um, we're a really odd mix. Because for one thing, about 10% of what we do is what I'm showing here. So we've, we've got a really broad plan that we're working on, and we just can't talk about it until the patents have issued. But we are a combination of a guy named Ken Trauner, who's an orthopedic surgeon from Stanford, and he's my business partner. We have a CEO, marketing guy. We have another industrial designer from Art Center. So he and I are kind of the industrial design component. 
and a couple programmers from Rice and a handful of other just random people. Um, as we add people, we'll probably add somebody in the fashion design world or jewelry design world um, and probably a biomedical engineer or two. So we're, really, we're a strange mix. When it works, it's a great synergy because nobody really overlaps anyone else enough to second guess anyone. Um, everybody has a, as kind of a domain. But it, we are a strange combination. I don't know how to define us. If we're jewelry, if we're fashion, if we're industrial design, product design, engineering, you know, that's kind of up for interpretation. And it kind of changes throughout the day. Yeah, so naturally the composition of our business is, is pretty varied as well. So can I ask you a question? So I, since I'm not here, I get to ask a question. Um, funding of this, I mean, I, you told me that you're just about to close your B round. If these are people who are investing at venture scale. Can you tell us a little, little bit about the business model and you know, how you pitch this to VCs? Mm -hmm. the, the question is, <laughs> is our business model and our funding. About a year ago, we, we spoke with an angel, and we, uh, we landed 3.4, I think, million. And that was our, our A round. And we're now in, our, in the midst of our B round. The A round is really based less on the stuff we're doing with prosthetics and more with the stuff that, unfortunately, we can't talk about. <laughs> so that's a, a, a very elusive response. Um, so, yes. <laughs> the, the, the prosthetic work is, is kind of sustaining itself, but it's really not the stuff that interests the VCs. Uh, the stuff that, that goes way beyond this is where they're interested. But this is a platform for us to explore a lot of the different technologies that we're using for, for other areas. Sparked off your passion in this area? The is what sparked off the passion in this area. I actually really think it was watching the $6 million man as a kid. That wasn't just like the get him laughing joke. That was real. I think that the $6 million man was this promise that, that with funding and, and some creativity, you can do anything. And you can augment a person in ways that you hadn't imagined. And what I think is exciting is that we are seeing that happen now. Maybe not the Steve Austin and the leisure suit thing, but we're seeing Oscar Pistorius running at Olympic speeds. We're seeing Amy Mullins as a supermodel. We're seeing... Um, any number of people who are doing these unbelievable things, climbing Everest and doing extreme sports of all kinds. And that's exciting. That's kind of, that changes the way we perceive it altogether. Because how disabled are they if they just ran past you in the Olympics? So it's, there's a lot of changing of our frame of reference that's happening right now. And I think it's kind of exciting to be a part of that. I mean, we're not doing the biomechatronics that's getting people running at high speeds, but we're doing the other component. You know, what, what happens when they're walking around town and getting into some of the psychology of it a little bit. So my passion is, is partly driven by being an industrial designer and looking for the ways where industrial design can really create meaning in somebody's life. Not to, it's not about selling product. It's about creating lasting meaning. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's far more significant and important, more satisfying to work with, yeah. Can you elaborate on the first rule that you mentioned about not trying to mimic the human body, because um, if, that's, if some of your customers uh, require that from you, isn't that an impediment to further growth, perhaps? Yeah, the question is, is um, the, the rule that we, our self-imposed rule that we will not mimic the human body. There are plenty of companies that will do that, and there are people who, who simply want that. They want painted toenails and, and uh, whatnot, and tissue-colored materials and things like that. And that's fine. That's... that's there are companies that do that, and that's, that's up to them. Our goal is really to, to rephrase the question because to some degree, that's saying that this is something that you should try to hide, that if you're an amputee, you should hide it, disguise it, and perhaps be ashamed of it to some extent. We're kind of saying, hey, don't be ashamed of it. Just make it the coolest thing anyone's ever seen, and it really rephrases the question in the first place. So we're not about disguising it or pretending it's something it's not. To us, really, beauty comes from honesty. And the honesty is to say, this is really what it is. It's a man-made thing. But it's a really, really beautiful man-made thing. I imagine you're doing a lot, obviously, innovating in the 3D printing area. Can you speak to where you see 3D printing and additive manufacturing? I mean, what's, what's your vision of where that goes? The, the question is, what's the trajectory for 3D printing and additive manufacturing? Um, that is a huge topic, and that's a really exciting topic. This is Columbus hitting that first rock and saying, there's something out there, and I don't know how big it is, but it's big. Um, 3D printing is going some big places. Um, I could spend the rest of the day talking about it, but I think the two interesting things, three interesting things, uh, 3D printing in space, that's going to be huge. That will happen. It's taking shape. 3D printing houses, 
for much cheaper and much better quality of everything you look for a house for. That is taking shape down at USC. Um, and 3D printing and biologics is the other one. That's happening in Berkeley, at UPIT, at a number of these places. We'll soon be able to three-dimensionally print tissue. And the promise there being that this will all be irrelevant when you can three-dimensionally print out of cultured cells a living tissue, bolt it on, connect the blood flow, and you can walk off. Okay, that's the simplification, but that is all in the works. So, yeah, 3D printing is just in a very, very nascent stage right now, and the trajectory is looking pretty exciting. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, more about this? Because I think you're sort of racing the technology, right? Your vision and the technology go hand in hand, and obviously the ideas that you had were initially ahead of the technology. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that, that race? Yeah. Well, uh, the question is how the race between the technology growing and our ambitions growing either work off each other or against each other. We set out with ambitions that were just beyond what the technology was capable of doing um, originally. And when we sh started showing these to the companies that make the 3D printers, they, they said, my God, I didn't know that was possible. And that was pretty exciting for us to, to actually blow away the companies who make the technology. And they've caught up, and they're doing some, some more elaborate things, but that just spawns our imaginations to go that much further. So we're always actually dismayed by how the technology hasn't yet caught up with the ambitions that we have. Our goals are much, much uh, beyond what the technology allows. The biggest problem with the technology with 3D printing in general is that it's too costly right now and it's too slow, that we always want faster and cheaper. And it's got a ways to go and the trajectory is not getting there as fast as we'd like for the kind of products that we'd like to do. So. We're waiting for that technology to, for, for the technology to catch up to the point where yeah, it can 3D print stuff very rapidly, strong, durable, and very cheap. It'll come. There are a bunch of revolutions that are right on the horizon, and, and the rumors, and we all know that it's on the way. But we have to just watch. And so our business model is actually anticipating this and hoping that once those floodgates are open, we can just ride the wave that follows. The question is, uh, we're focusing on the legs and why not the arms? And the main thing is that I set out to work for, when, when the whole project started, I was working for, uh, to come up with solutions for developing countries. And in an agrarian economy, a leg is so much more vital than an arm. Um, so that, that was the original goal. I'm on the phone quite a bit with the DOD and the VA, and they're wondering about arms because they have a lot of soldiers missing arms. It's a different technology, but in theory, it's not all that, all that much different from where we are. The challenge is that where the leg is basically two pivots, a ball pivot at the bottom and a, and a polycentric pivot at the knee, the arm has freedoms of motion that are much, much harder to replicate. So we started with lower hanging fruit that was perhaps more valuable, but my hope is to get there because the emotional value of a hand and an arm is still very, very great to the, uh, to the user. The question is how long the process takes from the scan to the, uh, the finished. Um, we actually like it to take a while because we want the person to let everything sink in and let it gestate. So we try to tell people two to four weeks. We can actually, if we have an emergency, we can create something in about a week. It takes about two days to do all the data and the design and the engineering and all that stuff. But we actually prefer to just give it time, let the person think about it. It's kind of like getting a tattoo. It's something you don't want to be too spontaneous about. You know, you really want to let that one sink in and do some debate before you, uh, a little bit of soul searching wants to, will go a long way. I think you, in the beginning you were talking about like, making the actual product. <coughs> and so I was just curious like, if you, how you think that would, like if you think that would help your, your business or, or what you have any plans on like making the question is, if, uh, is how possible and how realistic is it to create the actual prosthetic as opposed to the fairing that shrouds it? It's completely possible. Um, we walked all over Tahoe, which is a pretty challenging place to walk, with two legs that were entirely 3D printed. Um, the only difference is some ceramic bearings were thrown into the, the bearing races to cut down on friction and heat. Um, so it is entirely possible. It's really just that it is very different. It's something that prosthetists are not comfortable working with. There are a couple of little technical challenges, but it is completely possible.
I suspect it'll happen very soon. Germans are working on it. Fru, Frulander or something, a group out in Germany um, is making some great strides with it as well. Um, I was just at the VA in Texas and the, the DOD there, and they're working on doing the sockets 3D printed all the way through. So this is the way it will all go. It's just a question of who, who cracks some of the finer details. Uh, the question is, would we use the, the prosthetics that are 3D printed? Our goal would be to integrate the two so that it's all one. And that's, and that's kind of the, uh, like with this one, there isn't a, a, a separation between the mechanics, the hardware, and the structure and the fluidity of the form. It's all one. And that's, I think, ultimately the goal because that's the most biomimetic in a sense. That's really how our bodies are constructed. Different methods of 3D printing. Um, how do you choose uh, how how do you choose the method by which you print the uh, fairings, and why might that be the best method uh, to do so? The question is, uh, with all the different ways you can 3D print something now, why did we choose the one we did? Um, that was actually a very simple choice for us because there are lots of things you can print metal and you can print glass and sterling silver and everything you can imagine now. Um, we use a material called polyamide, which is nylon, which is very, very strong and light and dishwasher safe and everything that we like. It also comes in a very large print bed, 20 by 20 by 30 inches. So that lets us print a very large thing. But the, um, it, the main thing for us is it's durable. A lot of these materials are not durable. They're meant to be prototypes, so they're meant to show you what the shoe you design will look like in production. But there are only a few machines that will actually create a fully durable, ready-to-use part. Um, the 787 Dreamliner has lots of parts that are 3D printed on it. Um, a lot of the uh, new Stealth Fighter, it has 3D printed parts. If you get a new car, you're getting a lot of 3D printed parts. So the parts are now durable and kind of ready to be used as production parts right out of the gate now, which is why we use it, but it's one of the big shakeups that happen in the 3D printing world. role do you let the user play in the design process of this? I feel like, you know, you talk a lot about the person it being for them and not them by them. Where do you sort of draw the line as to how much role the user can play? In That's a really great question. How do we come up with the, the role of the user in this process? Because we want to make it a user participatory design process. The challenge is not everybody wants to be a designer. You know, from a designer's perspective, of course, everyone wants to be a designer, but that's actually not the case. You know, people are content looking at an iPhone and saying, do you want a black one or a white one? Um, some people. And we've had the range. Uh, we recently had a woman say, I want mermaids going up the back, and I want an uh, octopus wrapping around it. And we're saying, well, sorry, we can't. <laughs> you know, we're, we're limited. So we are trying to answer that ourselves. Uh, no matter what, we're using the person's body. So no matter what, it's that level of customized. We have all kinds of different materials and leather and, and uh, ballistic nylon and things like that that we can use. If somebody sends us a tattoo, black and white, we can laser tattoo that into the uh, leather. If they have specific patterns, we just had a guy, he wanted the San Diego Chargers logo. So we debossed that all throughout. Okay, that was fun and cool. So we have all kinds of latitude. It's really up to the person. If they want to be fully involved in the design process, or a lot of times what they'll simply say is, hey, that one on your website, I want one just like that. So we just leave that up to them. Um, when you realized your goal of kind of producing these prosthetics for like second and third world countries wouldn't be able to be accomplished, how did you kind of refocus and deal with that? Uh, the question was when, when it was obvious that the, the original intent of, of working for the th developing countries, when that fell through, how is the refocus, how did the refocus take place? That was a really challenging one because everything was looking good. I had people up and walking. All the technical hurdles were met. But then the, the economic uh, business model, which is not my forte, that fell apart. That was a painful one. And that was, that was a, a, a difficult one to kind of come down and, and realize, wow, I should have done the numbers before I started. Um, on the flip side, I, I like where it ended up. So it's, it wasn't a total loss. But it was a lot of saying, well, OK, Let's put that on the shelf until the day when this is ready, when it's fully baked, and move on to this other variation and see what can happen down that trajectory. So there's a lot of being able to kind of bite your lip and wince a few times and then move on. How do you go about acquiring customers? Like, 
customers? I mean, do most of your customers find you online? Um, do you uh, advertise? Like or military. You <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, do, so like, like my brother-in-law just came back from Afghanistan. He's fine. But um, so if somebody comes through like Walter Reed, they put them in touch with you guys, or how does that happen? <laughs> It's the, the question is how, how we connect to the people that we're working with. The amputee world, like, like a lot of communities, is very, very closely knit. So when there's any new innovation, everybody's telling everybody, it's telling everybody. It's, it's, it's the most viral group you could imagine connecting to because everybody wants to be aware of the new thing. If there's something new and advantageous and exciting, that word's going to get out fast. So there are probably very few amputees who don't know what we do, at least in a, in a vague sense. I spent a lot of time out at Walter Reed. I was just last week down at Center for the Intrepid in San Antonio and down at Balboa, and I'm going around to all of them again. Um, so we're getting very connected there because the military is excited about it. They're, in a strange way, they're the perfect demographic because they're guys in their early 20s. They are very, they're, they're still very body conscious. They're aware, you know, they came back, they're, they're wrecked in at least this one physical area, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what are the new ways that they can Kind of rethink things and get back get back into motion, and so they really connect with it. So I don't know how many amputees from Afghanistan, Iraq, we're doing, but but quite a few, and it's it's fascinating and really heart wrenching to hear all their stories too. You know, these guys in their early twenties, and it's they all have something pretty wrenching to relay to us. So yeah, that's something we're not used to. You know, in industrial design school, they don't tell you that that's what you have to deal with. Uh, to go worldwide, I assume that from the to the photo, you can reconstruct the whole leg, and you can just set it by normal port before you just acquire the photo, and you can just ship your legs everywhere. I mean, your equipment. The, the, the question is reduced to the community, which is here. Yeah. yeah. The question is, what's stopping us from going worldwide? Um, actually, nothing. We're working on that right now with Germany, and so we're spending quite a bit of time out there. You can sort of do it with a 2D camera. It's not quite baked yet. There's something that Autodesk is working on called PhotoFly, which is almost there, but we're giving it a little bit of time. It's not a fully baked software just yet. When that's ready, then your typical camera becomes a 3D scanner, if you know how to use it. Um, it's, and it's a pretty simple thing. The biggest disruptive technology in the 3D scanning world, of course, is the Kinect, the Xbox game controller. That is a very sophisticated 3D scanner. So a little bit of hacking on that turns, turns that into a very cheap upfront 3D scanner. Um, and we're, one of the things we're working on is, is coming up with um, ways of reducing the cost of 3D scanning so that we can propagate it. Because that right now, you're right, that is the bottleneck. Once we have the data, we can work worldwide without a problem. Um, the, the question is uh, about 3D cameras. We're watching 3D cameras uh, develop. They're not quite there yet. But we're watching them very carefully because the day that a 3D camera comes out that is capable of doing the kind of scanning that we need and creating the kind of data we need, yeah, we're, we're all over that. So, yeah, we have guys who watch that morning and night. So I, I'm curious. You said this is only 10% of your business and you've got 90% other things going on. I'm going to guess that you have lots of opportunities coming in the door. How do you evaluate these new things? I mean, now that you've gone through this process and you know, made some mistakes along the way in terms of understanding the market and the financial models, when new deals and new ideas come to you, how do you evaluate them? Okay, the question is what happens when, when new ideas and new, new concepts come our way? How do we weigh them? What are the metrics we use? Well, one of the dividends that came from watching my own original ambitions crash and burn was that I don't trust my own intuition <laughs> nearly as much anymore, that we actually have a full-time marketing guy now. And his job is to look at the numbers and the Venn diagrams and the insurance reimbursement codes and all these different things. And he does this very complex formula that I don't begin to understand. And he tells us, is this a viable thing to pursue or not? So it is actually, we're now marketing driven, which is kind of the last thing I ever thought I'd hear myself say. But he decides if it's going to be viable or not. And then we collectively decide, is it viable and does it work with our technology? Does it work with our, our ethos? Does it work, does it um, address the kind of things that we believe we can address well? And if we answer yes to all those, then we, we dive headlong into it. Um, we've, we've actually saved a couple lives so far, which 
is in the medical world is trivial, but in the design world, that's big because that never happens. <laughs> so we're kind of excited about that, that we've managed to come up with some technology that's really saved people. And so that, that really reinvigorates us. And it, it validates that, yeah, this little tangent we went down that saved somebody's life, that worked. That's cool. Okay, check. We can move on and assume that's, that's now a checkbox that we can uh, move on from. Since you brought it up, um, in, in our class we've been studying about you and your, your, the, your company and your business model, and we'll talk about this more when we, when we get you over there, but you talked about insurance and insurance reimbursement, and I think we know that, that, you're, that your fairies are not covered or, or, or have partially. not been, or yeah. partially. The question is, do you work, it seems that there's, thank you, there's reconstructive surgery, uh, that is for less functional things that gets covered. Are you doing anything in terms of lobbying with the insurance industry or doing any case studies about the emotional impact of the fairings so that you can move the dial on, on insurance reimbursement? That, that's a really good question because that is something we talk about every day. The question is, is how do we relate to the insurance companies because this is new and they don't like new stuff. Well, they, they don't know how to deal with new stuff. It takes a long evaluation for them to understand just what to make of it. Um, in our case, we can't lobby because that's a two- to four-year-out process. We just don't have the, the time to start lobbying insurance companies. We do a lot of prove it, show it, and get some responses back from it. And that has a certain value in itself. The challenge that we face is that they have their set of priorities, which doesn't necessarily jive with ours. So we can tell them, for example, that people come to us and they have duct tape and bubble wrap approximating their body form. That's fairly common. To us, that means everything. That means there's an unmet need here. And it's a profoundly unmet need that's going to drive somebody using duct tape and bubble wrap to approximate symmetry in their body. To an insurance company, that's less relevant because they're interested in getting them up and walking again. But the psychological value that returning symmetry and body form has is just harder to quantify. It's, it's not a yes, no answer. So it's a harder, harder story to tell. Yeah. So along similar lines, um, sort of with regards to a soccer player, um, you're sort of giving this new leg that sort of has more of a familiar feel to it. Do you think that actually enhanced functionality at all, like in terms of like mapping to you know, how you're going to control it compared to other things that are simply for functionality? The, the question is, do we add any additional functionality with, while returning the body symmetry to somebody? Is, is that well, correct? Or? Do you think that the psychology behind it, sort of like feeling better about the leg, actually made the functionality of it better compared to <coughs> just the straight up like, titanium rod? Sure. Yeah. And then the question is how, how the psychology might improve the quality of medicine or the quality of care that we're actually giving somebody. Those are questions that we look for answers to ourselves. I like to think that there might be some phantom limb issues that we can address, and we're hoping to start a study to see if returning very accurate body symmetry to somebody addresses phantom limb at all. Um, it's anyone's guess. Phantom limb is a very elusive one to look into. The other question, well, somebody can return to a much more active life because there are a lot of sports that you just can't do with a pipe. So, for example, we have people who are back to snowboarding and skiing and rollerblading and hiking because you can't really strap a you know, sports performance boot down unless you have a degree of body symmetry because that's just the way your, your brain maps it. So there's some of that functionality. I think that it's a very difficult one to quantify. Um, just the one thing we do know is that people will tell us, yeah, they're more active, they're more out there. You know, they can't wait to kind of walk around and get responses. And I like to think that that translates into just a more active life in general and that that has some medicinal value in its own weird way. But yeah, we don't know, and it's just hard for us to quantify. So the new stuff you can't talk about. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, could you, well, could you talk a little bit about the process of how, as a, as a, as an entrepreneur, you balance between the stuff you're making money on today and the stuff you're doing for the future? How you manage your team? How you manage your budget? How do you manage your business balancing between those things? The question is how, how we manage the business balancing between the stuff we're doing today and the R&D that we're doing for future developments. The, that's a challenge, and that's one of those things, again, that, that I'm very ill-equipped to make those decisions. 
um, being a, an indi industrial designer with a background more in the arts than in the business. So my heart lies in certain things, you know, in being able to connect these people when, when somebody feels their leg and they can feel their shape for the first time again. You know, reconnecting that sense of self to somebody. To me, that's really valuable. To the pure nuts and bolts of the business of it, it's not terribly profitable. Nobody's going to retire off of doing the work that we're doing here. It just it doesn't scale. There aren't enough amputees. The market isn't there. So we're not, we're not telling ourselves that that's a huge growth area. But it's something that we do as, as a test bed, and we do it really because we love doing it. You know, I don't mind throwing away a Saturday if I'm creating something for somebody that's going to change every day for the rest of their life. That, that to me is a trade-off that, that I'm very willing to make. But as far as being able to come up with a very logical, sound business model, luckily we have a business guy who just does that, and he thinks about that stuff night and day, and he can give those answers, and, and he really does more of the evaluation as far as what makes sense from the business perspective. So I'm a very visual person, and I know you are as well. I could you draw us a picture, paint us a picture of what the space looks like that you work in? Because I'm going to guess that the space has some reflection of what you do, and what you do is influenced by the space you work in. The, the question is, is what the space we, uh, we work in looks like. And that's, that's a really cool question I've never heard before. Um, we sweated over that. I told a realtor, if it looks like a lawyer would like this building, we don't like it already and don't even show us in the first place. It has to look interesting and funky and different because nobody can think conventionally in our office because that will be the death, to us, the death blow to us. So we actually have Charles Schultz's old building, Charles Schultz who created Snoopy. So we're the new Snoopy, we'd like to think. It's an old building in the historic part of San Francisco between the Globe and Bix restaurants, and it has open beam ceilings and a lot of light and, and glass that's getting wavery from the century of, of um, melting. And... It, um, we have drawings and sketches and inspirational images, things that we like all over the wall. And <clears throat> those might be Kaltrava or Zaha Hadid's architecture. Um, they might be fashion shots. They might be motorcycles or cars. Anything that has some kind of connotation that we like that, that we're going to connect with. And the interesting thing is also how we all live up to our individual stereotypes. Because our programmers have cans of Dr. Pepper and Jolt and, and Red Bull by their computers. The designers have all this like cool stuff and Curve magazine and all these things. Um, so, and then the, the medical people all have all these really thick you know, doorstop medical tomes next to their computers. So we all are, are painfully victims to our own stereotypes. And you see that immediately when you walk in. And we have showcases, of, we have showcases with all of our parts all, all over the walls. So it does feel like you stepped into the 23rd century when you walk in. Terrific. I'm sure you'll agree this was totally fascinating. Join me in thanking Scott Sennett. Thank you.